again, good morning uh, for Paraguay and good night for good evening for Australia. And today is day one of this series of talks uh, for Paraguay Speaks. And I'm happy to be um, joining and presenting the, our panel uh, about this topic that is for Paraguay is very important because our economy is based on two or sit on two legs, uh, agriculture for soybean exports, and also meat or livestock. Um, the importance of livestock is because it generates uh, jobs and the impact for the, from the COVID was not so hard on Paraguay because we export meat. So in our economy, it's also uh, a continuing and progress uh, building up. Uh, but the technology is not quite so good like other countries, like Australia. So we hope to learn here today. And the Paraguayan presenters, they are going to show us the situation in Paraguay right now, how we are doing things. And the Professor Colin is going to present us how Australia is succeeding in uh, being in the top of uh, livestock production in the world. So uh, Professor Andrea Weller, Professor Norman Brower, Brewer and Professor Mariana Garcia from Paraguay are going to be speaking about Paraguay, and Professor Brendan Cullen about Australia. So we have prepared some uh, questions and the speakers, they will uh, talk about it and they will have a, around 10 minutes to do so. Um, the first one to start is going to be Andrea Weiler. So Paraguay, and the first question for her is, Paraguay is today the sixth largest producer of beef in the world. However, sustainability is often questioned in environmental, social, and economic terms. From your perspective and taking into account your experience and trajectory, we have two questions for you. Uh, do you consider that livestock production in Paraguay is sustainable? And the second part is, what processes do you think should be prioritized at the social, political, and economic or environmental level in order to achieve sustainable production under international standards? So Andrea, you have here like... Excuse me, that, that question was for Norman Brewer. Uh, he will start. Yes. Sorry, Norman. Yeah. And before Norman starts, uh, I would like to introduce him. So Norman Brewer uh, holds an agriculture engineering degree with focus on livestock production. Norman earned a master's degree in tropical conservation and development and a PhD in an interdisciplinary ecology, working in resilience uh, in agricultural system from the University of Florida, Gainesville, USA. He co-developed climate-based decision support system, working simultaneously as a senior scientist at the Rosenthal School of Atmospheric Science at the University of Miami, an assistant professor at the University of Florida from 2003 through 2014. Currently, he is principal consultant at Science, Ciencia Agroambiental and associate professor at the UC in Asuncion. He has authored 80 publications and he's ranked researcher at CONACIT, our Council for Science and Technology, and is a member of the National Climate Change Commission of Paraguay. So Norman, the space is yours. Sorry, Andrea. Thank you, Julio, for that introduction. I uh, would like to thank the Paraguayan Student Association of the University of Melbourne for organizing this, Melbourne. And um, I have a lot to cover and only 10 minutes, so I'm gonna dive straight into this. Uh, my title is Sustainable Beef Production in Paraguay, Whose Reality Counts? The answers to the questions are uh, contained within the presentation. So what is sustainable beef and why are people talking about it so much? Their main drivers are population growth and GDP growth, urbanization, and globalization. 
there is actually more demand for meat in the world now, in spite of what you've heard about plant-based meat and uh, cell culture meat. This leads to increased production and that creates concerns over sustainability. For those of you who don't know Paraguay very well, it's a landlocked country in the middle of South America, about the size of California, with a subtropical climate, two regions, east and west, the Oriental and Chaco region, a little over 7 million people and a nominal GDP of $40 billion. As you see on the map, uh, Paraguay is flat. We have no mountain ranges, uh, no other major geographical or climatic issues. And so depending on your point of view, it can be either a country blessed with the ability of producing uh, food on almost its entire uh, extension, its entire area, uh, or it, it may be a curse because uh, it makes it uh, much more difficult to uh, conserve land as is done in more mountainous or arid countries in the world. As far as cattle, we have about twice as many cattle as we have people. The uh, herd fluctuates. It went down a bit during COVID and is growing again, mostly in the Chaco. A lot of our producers have very high technology. As an example, we've had the Brangus world champ bull twice. Um, yeah, world champ. Our slaughter ages and weights are among the what is typical at the worldwide level. As far as ranchers, um, we have about 125,000 ranchers in Paraguay, of whom the great majority have less than 100 head. Um, there are about 12,000 who have between 100 and 1,000 head. And the great majority of cattle, especially of quality cattle, quality cattle, cattle and, and high tech, is owned by about 2,500 owners who have more than 1,000 head. And when I say of more than a thousand, we're talking 20, 30, 40, 50,000 head. Our strength is in pasture fed production, which aims at marketing opportunity and allows us for promoting uh, green beef or natural beef. There is a certification system in place and traceability system called CITRAP, but it so far it only extends to, to uh, beef that's to be exported to the European Union, which is a, a prime cut market. Um, what's going on? So I'll, I'm going to address uh, some issues that go a little deeper uh, into economic, environmental, and social. I'm going to address ecosystem services, carbon, best practices, and social issues in light of the fact that my colleagues will likely address biodiversity and methane. Just what are we talking about when we say sustainable? goes all the way back to the Brundtland Commission in the late 80s. It's we must produce in a way that we don't compromise the ability of future generations to do so. And as far as beef production, it must be economically viable, environmentally safe, and socially just. But this presents a lot of problems. There's no definitive answer or right answer to what is sustainable. A range of possibilities exist. And uh, a better question would be more or less sustainable compared to what? It's, it's very rarely a binary answer. A lot of the uh, indicators are difficult to measure and put into practice and key stakeholders within the chain have different perspectives. The relationships, especially the power relationships that underlie the challenge are complex, systemic and uncertain. In addition, the definition needs to be adjusted to a particular context, which is beef production in Paraguay, which as Julio mentioned, is one of the top 10 beef exporters. We do have some certification, which has mostly to do with the quality of beef and um, the indicators that, as I mentioned, to, to, to become sustainable are qualitative and quantitative. Quantitative is the easier part and qualitative is a little more or a lot more difficult because it's based more on narrative and is um, there are many more opinions regarding the qualitative aspects of sustainability. One strength of Paraguay is that we have good laws and advanced technology, at least as far as our major producers are concerned. All the way back in 1973, they had the vision 
of making a law that requires ranchers to leave 25% of their, to conserve 25% of their forest. And when you add protection of streams and rivers um, and these strips, these green strips you see in the right uh, upper right corner, those are uh, windbreaks uh, to, to prevent soil erosion, but they also function as a sort of biodiversity corridor. Um, in the lower left picture, you can see uh, water harvesting practices, uh, which we learned a lot from Australia. As a matter of fact, any elevated tank in the Chaco is called an Australian tank. We've done some work on this and came up with five principles, which are not too different from the innovation principle, principles used in other areas of the world. Efficiency and innovation, health and animal welfare, food safety, natural resources, and people and communities. It's a very complex issue going from down to up on this slide to go from principles to criteria to objectives to parameters and finally arrive at indicators that can be measured at the ranch level or the packing plant level. There is a technical matrix of over 150 indicators uh, that become a checklist um, for each for each member of the chain. Now, this wasn't done a, in a vacuum. We used previous experiences in Paraguay and specialized literature uh, from the Global Roundtable, uh, the Paraguayan Table for Sustainable Beef, the Alliance for uh, Grasslands, some FAO work, the Green Commodities and Green Chaco platforms of UNDP, and some excellent work done by the NGO Solidaridad. This, for example, is uh, work that Solidaridad did in conjunction with CREA, which is a group of producers. And they uh, used six pilot farms and took uh, several years of data on soil uh, organic carbon and came up with the best practices that when you do data management, strategic supplemental feeding, forage balance, pasture rotation, ant control, nearby water with solar pumps, a re uh, rehabilitation of bald patches and human resource training, it, it, the best outcomes occur. And they measured soil organic carbon uh, sequestration as between one and three tons per hectare, uh, which is a very hopeful amount. We, we hope to get to higher levels with better uh, management up to five tons per hectare would be ideal. And those are also reachable numbers in the oriental region of Paraguay. Ranches also provide ecosystem services, quite a lot as a matter of fact. Uh, carbon sequestration, which we just talked about, soil quality, scenic beauty and recreation, cultural maintenance. I might mention that Paraguay has a cowboy and cattle culture that goes back uh, 400 years to colonial times. Um, obviously habitat for wildlife, river and stream protection, and non-timber forest products for consumption. Here are just some pictures uh, and I'll draw your attention to the uh, tapers in the bottom left picture. And on the bottom right picture, you can see an agroforestry, I'm sorry, a silvopastoral system where we leave 30 or 40 algarrobo, which is a prosopis species um, in each pasture, um, a system that is being more widely adopted right now in some parts of the Chaco. And it's very important to mention that our beef is grass fed and mostly grass finished. Regarding climate, Paraguay has historically contributed very little or nothing to global greenhouse gases. However, land use change within what we produce has been more important than ag and beef. An expert panel determined that 75% of pastures in our country are well managed and that helps with, with soil organic carbon sequestration. If we use global warming potential to uh, measure methane, then land use change would still be a higher contributor than the cattle themselves. But in the end, these figures only appear to be high because Paraguay is non-industrialized. We do not have coal-based or petroleum-based industries in Paraguay. And most of our, 99% of our electricity is renewable. And so uh, it looks like we're a much higher emitter than we are for this reason. Social issues include an active campaign by the ARP uh, against child labor on ranches, 
on the job training, which is very important, especially on safety issues. And some 600,000 jobs in the entire value chain are created by livestock. There is some overlap here with agriculture because in the Eastern region, many ranchers have become row crop farmers uh, in addition to ranching. Traditionally, ranchers contribute to local community schools, churches, road maintenance, which should be a government job, but which ranchers take on themselves and emergency needs of the local population. There are also ongoing programs uh, for gender and indigenous inclusion. The last question you asked was, what are the greatest challenges? I, I'm listing a few and I'm highlighting one. Framing and translating the message about um, sustainable um, ranching is, is, is a difficulty, it's a challenge. The row crop expansion in the Chaco is a challenge, but it's also the greatest opportunity we've had in Paraguay to do things right from the get-go, to create integrated systems and use a no-till planting system, which we've uh, reached a high degree of in the eastern region of Paraguay and doing it even better in the Chaco. There's a challenge to reach small producers in Paraguay, and there are literally no monetary incentives to be sustainable. Um, tax breaks could be one, uh, a premium price could be another. Um, but the, in the end, because there are so many different people working on sustainable livestock in Paraguay, sustainable beef, there is a government, governance challenge, which I think is the largest. We have at least 10 different checklists from packing plants, from the finance, sustainable finance table from NGOs, from multilaterals, from the government. And we need to harmonize these so that people can understand and we can be taken seriously overseas. This includes- oh, have, Yeah, one minute, thank you. Okay, this includes producers, abattoirs, banks, and others. Uh, and through dialogue consensus, we can reach agreements with these institutions for effective management and governance. Finally, is beef production in Paraguay sustainable? It depends on what set of standards one uses and where power lies. Much beef production is sustainable, especially among larger and medium producers. Over 90% is grass finished, 75% well-managed pastures. Uh, Infona says there is 75% forest law compliance. We need, to we need to develop reachable thresholds for small and medium farmers and perhaps regional criteria because it's not the same to produce cattle in the swamps of Yembuku as it is in the dry Chaco. And finally, we need a strong signal from incentives and I mean monetary signal um, to convince producers that that is what they need to do. Thank you very much. And I think we'll entertain questions later. Thank you very much, Norman. Yes, questions are gonna be at the end after all the presentations are done. So now we move on to uh, Andrea Whaler. Andrea Whaler is uh, currently finishing her PhD in biology and conservation of biodiversity from the University of Salamanca, Spain. Andrea is also a master of science in wildlife from New Mexico State University in the US. She's a Bachelor of Science degree in biology, and she has published over 50 scientific research papers. It's a one researcher in Paraguay and focuses on biodiversity conservation in productive landscapes. So Andrea, Andrea, uh, we have here a couple of questions for you. And the first one is uh, worldwide biodiversity is threatened uh, partially due to land use change for agricultural production in general. So considering your experience as a producer and a researcher in biodiversity conservation, what do you recognize as the main opportunities and challenges for biodiversity conservation in Paraguay in productive systems? Thank you, Andrea, and the floor is yours. Okay, um, I want to talk about my experience in research in um, cattle ranch systems in Paraguay. 
Um, most of the cattle ranch systems in Paraguay, uh, the cattle production depends on infrastructure and logistics in the, uh, in the ranches. And uh, the cattle management in, in per se and the care of, of the cattle. Um, the main systems in Paraguay, uh, we can do breeding, rearing, fattening, or the whole system. And those systems include, um, can, excuse me, uh, can influence a lot when we talk about uh, wildlife conservation in cattle ranches. This is a typical cattle ranch in, in the Chaco where you can see that they have a forest, 25% of the property, the forest strips that contribute about 15 extra per percent of trees covered to the property. The pasture mainly uh, a sil silvopastoral system and the water sources in the dry Chaco is a very area, arid climate. So uh, gathering water and maintain water through the year is one of the most challenging things uh, in that region to do cattle ranching. So the first thi thing I want to talk to you is about a contribution of those water systems in biodiversity conservation. We did a research with uh, camera traps and medium and large size mammals uh, to understand how water systems uh, contribute to the maintenance of local biodiversity. And we evalu evaluate those systems and we could find that 83% of the mammals from the region uses those water systems. And uh, one of the things that we were thinking about that those water systems were used only during dry seasons, but we found out that most of the wildlife use those water systems year round, not only when, when the dry season was. We also um, com um, contrast the wildlife use of those water systems, depending of they were uh, surrounded for forest or pastures. And we could find a difference among the wildlife community that uses those systems, uh, being um, more forest species uh, using those uh, water like uh, tapirs and collar peccaries and the chacoan peccaries uh, near forest sources and uh, near pastures we we found more uh, common species and and other species that are in uh, growing their distribution area in Paraguay due to cattle ranching that is for example the uh, capybara. Capybara is the biggest rodent in the world, and it was used to be only near big rivers. And now, due to those uh, permanent water systems and pastures uh, development, capybaras are entering into the dry Chaco area. Another research that we did that was uh, we measured biodiversity inside the forest at the forest edge, one kilometer inside the productive landscape, two kilometer inside the productive landscape and more than three kilometers and compare the community mammals at those points. And as you can see in the, in the chart, uh, the community mammals uh, remains uh, mainly the, the same uh, during the landscape. So we can see that um, mammals use those forest strips 
as biodiversity corridors, we can find differences in the amount of use, of course, um, near the forest, we have more use. And as long as you go away, you have less use. Uh, we also find that some species doesn't use those uh, forest trips as corridors that are very uh, forest related species. And for example, um, we can see here the, um, Um, the um, uh, white lipid peccary that they they have very big heads and doesn't move uh, much up, away from uh, forest forest patches, and so the wine scooter that wa were created but by law, uh, there are on not only wine scooter but also provides biodiversity corridors and also. Uh, are very good for reducing heat stress in beef cattle. There are some research going on in the, the Chaco area in that way. So it's, um, they, they cover many, many functions. Uh, after that, we have the forest that is the 25% of the property. And here I show you a slide with a non-metric multidimensional scaling showing difference among the mammal, mammal communities in relation to the distance from the forest edge. In blue and light blue, you have the forest community mammals and they go apart very well from the uh, other circles that show uh, community mammals more related with uh, pasture um, areas. So with that slide, um, I, the, the, my point here is that forest is very important when we talk about sustainability. Um, so if we have those landscapes with the 25% of forest cover, we can work in conservation program if we can connect one forest patch to another to make those systems more sustainable or to let, uh, when we make new development, try to get those forest patches from different owners all together to have bigger sufferers to cover uh, those species. Many of them are in endangered species, critically endangered species. Um, and we have also uh, endemic species here with, uh, the, for example, a peccary that is, uh, the Chacoan peccary was believed to be extinct and rediscovered to science in 1973. And, these species only live in the dry Chaco area. So uh, one of the main conservation issues here with the ranching, uh, cattle ranching producing is to keep these, these species uh, alive and in, in to provide habitat and the needs so we can uh, talk about long-term conservation. So the those are the potential of, of producing and, and conservation of wildlife. And the three points I want to mention here, one is the sustainability of the system. So we have to assess the, that sustainability in the cattle production. And we are trying to do some uh, um, SAFA uh, is a, um, is, is one of the methods to address sustainability that is proposed for this FAO and cover four main areas so, that are good governments, environmental minute. integrity, left, Thank you. economic resilience and social well-being. The other thing that Norman was talking about was improving efficiency in the cattle ranching system and uh, the, the other thing is addressing conflict with ranchers between the jaguars on, and other biodiversity to have those systems being more sustainable.
I did stop. Thank you very much, Andrea, for your presentation. Uh, we are going to keep the questions to uh, at the end. So we are going to go to the next uh, presenter. So uh, the next one is uh, Mariana Garcia. Uh, she's a colleague and a friend. Uh, she was born in and grew up in Asuncion, Paraguay. In 2011, she received her Bachelor of Science degree in Agricultural Engineering from the University Universidad Nacional de Asuncion. In 2013, she was awarded the Fulbright Las Pau Fellowship to pursue graduate studies, studies in the United States. She successfully completed her Master of Science in Animal Science in 2016 at the University of Florida, North Florida Research and Education Center. In 2016, she was awarded a UF Graduate School Fellowship and received her Doctor of Philosophy degree in 2020. Mariana is passionate about the science behind climate change and wants to focus her career on the application of mitigations and adaptation strategies to promote a more climate smart livestock and agricultural production. She's currently a research professor at the Universidad Nacional de Asunción and a partner at Ciencia Agroambiental Consulting Agency. So Mariana, uh, considering your research career in animal science and research on the reduction of methane emissions through nutritional strategies, could you please talk about uh, why is it important to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from livestock production in the context of climate change? Thank you, Mariana. Yes, thank you, Julio, and thank you to all the organizers for the invitation. Just uh, let me know if, uh, if you can see the, the slides clearly. Uh, so yes, today I would like to briefly talk, because we just have 10 minutes, about uh, decreasing greenhouse gases uh, from livestock in the context of climate change and why should we care about it. So I'm pretty sure that all of you are aware of all the climate anomalies and extreme weather events that we've been experiencing. Uh, you, most of you, are, or some of you are watching from Australia, so you're familiar with wildfires. Uh, we have severe droughts here in Paraguay. And actually, I decided to put this picture from 2018. Uh, in 2018, I was finishing my second year of my PhD, and I was here located in the north uh, part of Florida, in the Florida Panhandle, when we were hit by Hurricane Michael. Uh, it was <laughs> the third most uh, intense hurricane that uh, they experienced in the United States. And to this day, um, the economic impact can still be felt among ranchers and cattle producers in Florida. Uh, more uh, locally, uh, this is a picture from last year. Uh, it was taken in Rio Verde in the Chaco region here in Paraguay. Uh, and last year, uh, between August and October, we have a severe drought. And uh, in some particular weeks, this drought was accompanied by some strong wind with created, uh, which created conditions for wildfires to occur. This picture actually belongs, uh, was sent uh, to me by, by a fellow uh, friend, by a, uh, a cattleman. And you can see here the level, not only of ecological destruction, but you can also imagine the economic impact that these severe uh, weather uh, events have on our economy. So, uh, we all talk and we all hear about climate change, so I'm, I cannot spend too much time talking about the, the physics and about the basics, uh, but, but I would like to discuss some, some of the basic concepts of climate change. So we are experiencing some unprecedented changes in regional and global climate, and you can see here that especially after, uh, since the second portion um, of the 20th century, we have uh, experienced an increase in temperatures of light. Uh, an ocean. And this is accompanied, of course, by an increase in sea levels because of the melting of the ice caps. And this is all related to an increase in the concentration of uh, atmospheric greenhouse gases, particularly CO2 that you can see here in green, but also some other greenhouse gases as methane, you can see it here in orange, and as well as nitrous oxide. But uh, throughout my presentation, I want to, to make uh, a point very clear that most of these uh, emissions um, come from the fossil fuel industry, as you can see here in this gray shade area. And most of these emissions and most of the warming that we're experiencing are coming from CO2 emissions. 
Uh, so we, it's impossible to predict all the consequences of climate change, but we can start, we, we are feeling some of the impacts already. And I decided to put this picture from the IPCC AR5 today. Actually, they released uh, a preprint, if I can say so, uh, of the AR6. So we're going to see how this data changed or has been improved. But you can see here that there are many different systems that are affected by climate change. And uh, what brings us here today is actually the impact that climate change will have on food production. And of course, if food production is affected, we're going to have significant a significant negative impact on the livelihood of millions of people across the world. Uh, so when we are talking about greenhouse gas emissions and why should we reduce or decrease methane emissions or CO2 emissions, it's important to understand that there are different sources of greenhouse gases. So we see here that globally, uh, and I just wanted to, to focus on the, on the word global or globally, uh, the energy sector is the one that accounts for most of the emissions around the world. And we see here that actually agriculture, forestry and land use accounts for less than 20% of all the emissions with livestock and manure just accounting for a little bit less than 6% of the emissions. But um, according to the uh, Paris Climate Agreement, uh, from which Paraguay is, uh, is part, we need to we need to account uh, our own emissions as a country, and we need to make sure that uh, we're complying with this, uh, with this agreement and that we're making our part to decrease uh, greenhouse gas emissions globally. But when we are talking about greenhouse gas emissions, we need to consider two things, how much we're actually contributing in net amount. So as Norman mentioned before, Paraguay contributes to less than, uh, sorry, this design is wrong. Uh, Paraguay contributes to less than 0.1% of the total greenhouse gas emissions in the world. But we see that here, and without considering carbon sinks, uh, approximately fifth, a little bit over 50% of the emissions are coming from agriculture and livestock production. But not all carbon emissions are the same, and this is something that we need to consider when we are discussing uh, greenhouse gases. So as you can see here, we have methane that is uh, being produced here in the rumen of, of, uh, of ruminants, uh, and it's belch, and it has um, an atmospheric lifetime of between 10 and 12 years. Then it's, this methane is going to be photochemically oxidated to CO2, and then uh, this CO2 is again going to be um, uh, used for the synthesis of biomass through photosynthesis, and then it's going to be uh, it's going to be uh, uptaken again uh, by cows or by cattle in this case. So we call this the bio biogenic carbon cycle, and it's different to CO2 emissions that are coming from from the fossil fuel industry because uh, we have carbon stocks here in the earth. This carbon is being extra extracted, and it's not part of the of this biogenic carbon cycle. What we're doing uh, when we're burning, burning fossil fuels is actually introducing new CO2 or new carbon to the atmosphere. And actually, this is the main contributor to climate change. So as long as we keep uh, stable methane emissions, uh, we're not going to have an accumulation of carbon or we're not going to have an accumulation of CO2 in the atmosphere. But for this to be true, we need constant emission rates and we need the oxidation of methane to offset uh, the emissions. So uh, also it's important to mention that these different lifetime that different greenhouse gases have, of course, have different effects on temperature. So as I mentioned before, methane has an atmospheric lifetime of between 10 to 12 years in the atmosphere. So it degrades pretty fast if we compare it especially to CO2. So CO2 has different uh, atmospheric lifetimes depending on which thing is uptaking the CO2 in the atmosphere. But we can say that it can take up to 1,000 years for the CO2 to be degraded or to be uptaken uh, in the atmosphere. And of course, this has a significant impact on the warming effect. So we see here that if the emission rate increases at a constant rate, and we have the case here for CO2, we're going to have an exponential increase in warming. And this is because the CO2 is accumulated in the atmosphere. It doesn't degrade as fast as methane. But what we see here, is that there is a more direct response between uh, that relates better uh, emissions of methane with the effect on warming. So we see here the case that I was referring before, if we maintain a steady emissions of methane, we're not going to have an effect on, 
uh, or we're not going to have an, an effect on or of increased temperature or increased warming. And what we see here, and actually these are the kind of scenarios that should, we should uh, be concerned about right now. If we start to decrease our methane emissions here in blue, we're going to have a cooling event that's going to happen pretty fast. But in the case of CO2, as long as we keep emitting CO2, we're going to have an increase in temperature. And that's because it keeps accumulating. So you see here in this point is when we should read carbon zero emissions. And we see that it's just at that point that we uh, reach a stable temperature. So it's not even going down, it's going to be stable. So uh, the main point here is, uh, is what we are doing now, it's going to have an impact on future generations. And actually right now, the warming that we're experiencing is probably coming from CO2 emissions from the past. So to the point, uh, why should we care then about decreasing methane emissions? And that's because uh, we need to achieve uh, the targets that were, uh, that were set in the, in the Paris Climate Agreement. And we see here that we're, we need to be between 2 and 1.5 degrees of, uh, over pre-industrial levels. And we see that the only way we can do that is if we reduce or decrease CO2 emissions. But in addition to that, we decrease uh, methane emissions or short-lived climate pollutants as well. One minute left. I know I have just, yeah, one minute left. So uh, what we're trying to do in order to decrease our, our emissions uh, from the livestock perspective is to apply climate smart agriculture. So agriculture and livestock are both victims or perpetrators of climate change, but we need to apply not only mitigation strategies, and, but we also need to adapt to this new climate change situation. We need to understand that we need to feed the future generations. Um, Especially, uh, we're going to experience some uh, increases in, 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 in population in sub-Saharan Africa, as well as Southeast Asia. So we need, we need to be ready to feed, to feed the world. And finally, uh, just two points that I would like you to consider. Not all land can be cropped. And actually, 60% of all agricultural land cannot be used for crops. But we can definitely use livestock there, goats, camels, sheep, cattle. Uh, that's that's a way we can we can make an efficient use of that kind of land. And finally, uh, again, going back to maintaining stable methane emissions, we need to we might need to focus on increasing our efficiency of production. So you see here, and this is the case for Paraguay, we have been increasing our beef production, but we are the, we have been also decreasing our intensity in methane emissions. So that's the amount of CO two equivalents that we produce per kilogram of beef. So those are strategies that we need to consider in order to maintain stable, at least stable methane emissions. And with that, I would like to thank you and I will be ready to, to have some discussion at the end. And for sure, we'll have some questions for you, Mariana, later. Thank you very oh, much. Oh, nice. <laughs> nice. <laughs> okay, now we go to Australia with Professor Brennan Cullen. I'm going to introduce him a little bit. Uh, he's a senior lecturer in grazing systems in the Faculty of Veterinary and Agricultural Science at the University of Melbourne. Has a bachelor in agricultural science and a doctorate of philosophy from the University of Melbourne. Over the last 15 years, Brennan has worked on a series of research projects with the dairy and red meat industries to understand the impact of projected climate change on livestock production business across Australia and has over a hundred scholarly works, publications. So Brendan, Australia is regarded as the third largest beef exporter in the globe. And in recent years, the Australian red meat and livestock industry has set the goal to become a carbon neutral industry by 2030. Sustainability and animal welfare are becoming increasingly important for both the industry and the environment. So, uh, could you please provide us an overview on the status of livestock production sustainability in Australia and state the path ahead for the industry in the climate change context? Thank you very much, Professor. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and thank you for the invitation to speak with you uh, today. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to uh, talk about the sustainability uh, issues mainly in relation to the climate change issue and building on the previous talk, which talked about, you know, both uh, climate change having an impact 
on production systems, but also livestock production systems contributing some emissions to that. So that's going to be the main focus of my presentation uh, today. Uh, so you can see in the picture there um, an example of a, a livestock production system from southern Australia. It's um, you might see some trees and some pasture, so very much a pasture-based uh, production system um, in, in Australia um, with some trees in the background. You'll see some beef cattle, some Herefords in the background and also some sheep. So we have a quite a big sheep population uh, as well as, as cattle. Um, so yeah, many similarities uh, between what we've talked about with Paraguay this evening uh, and the Australian uh, production systems. Um, so I'm not going to go into too much detail, but to provide an overview of some of the, the challenges that we're facing um, in, in a climate change uh, context. Uh, so um, the climate is changing, I guess, for our Australian producers, we have experienced these climate extremes. We are experiencing more variability. Uh, we're experiencing changes to rainfall patterns. Um, and that is now well accepted by our agricultural community. And the job is really about uh, both adaptation, so changing systems to, to meet our new climate normal or changing climate, uh, and also about reducing emissions. So um, this changing climate is move, shifting our, our pasture growth patterns. So we're growing more at different times of year. Uh, and as pasture growth, it really is the foundation of our livestock production, our beef industries and our uh, sheep industries. Uh, that has important implications for the number of stock we can run and the way we manage them. Um, maintaining soil organic uh, matter or soil carbon, uh, as particularly as Southern Australia has dried uh, and become warmer, uh, we're not growing as much pasture as we were with, um, uh, with the climate that we have. Uh, so uh, maintaining our soil carbon levels is a challenge moving into the future. Heat stress on livestock, um, is increasingly important. Uh, and I looked with envy at some of those pictures of the silver pastoral systems and the, um, and the trees in the landscape uh, in Paraguay, because in, particularly in Southern Australia, much of, that, um, much of that tree vegetation has been removed and we don't have that, uh, sh those shade and shelter benefits uh, that we increasingly need uh, in our changing climate. Um, I would say industry confidence has taken a hit in our livestock um, industries. Uh, people haven't had the confidence to invest um, over the last 10 years. Um, some more favourable seasons in the last two years is probably starting to turn that around, uh, but significant um, and prolonged drought through um, much of Australia, you know, over uh, uh, much of the last 10 years has, has been a significant issue. And um, we also have the pressure to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, um, which was part of the question and I'll, I'll come back to. So we have a aspirational target for our red meat industries to become carbon neutral. And this comes from our uh, red meat industry body, which is Meat and Livestock Australia. Um, and so I think we're, the industry is probably in early days about how that gets achieved, but really the challenge is to balance both production uh, adaptation to the changing climate and mitigation and thinking about how our farm systems need to evolve um, to meet those uh, challenges. Um, and we're seeing increased e um, emphasis on uh, risk management systems. So risks with climate, risks with bushfires, floods, um, those sorts of stream extreme events. Uh, we're starting to see more diversification uh, so certainly some of our large um, beef producing companies have um, historically had a lot of diversification, say through, through Northern Australia and, and Eastern Australia, where they would have different farms in different climatic zones to manage the climate risk. So areas that um, um, uh, if, if one area is 
not having a good season than other areas might, and they have the ability to be uh, flexible um, and resilient in their production systems. But we're seeing um, increasing diversification and spatial diversification of, of farm systems, taking advantage of different um, environmental niches as, um, as farms get bigger in general as well. Okay, so I guess one of the biggest things we've seen over the last 20 years is this um, decline in uh, winter and spring rainfall across southern Australia. So um, all the patches of uh, reddy brown type colours in there indicate very much below average rainfall. This is uh, from the period of um, April to October, which is our main uh, growing season uh, in southern Australia, both for pastures, but also for cereal crops. Um, so lowest on record, um, very much below average across most of southern Australia. And in northern Australia, that moves into a subtropical and tropical environment where there's not much winter rainfall. So that's not um, clearly marked on the map here. Um, but these um, declining rainfall patterns, which we've seen largely from about 1999, uh, 2000, and, and consistently um, interspersed with a, a few wet years, uh, but, but not very many. Uh, so this pattern has become entrenched um, and people are uh, starting to adapt to this. This is um, uh, also, there's been warming of the temperatures associated with this as well, um, which further exacerbates uh, the water stress situation. Um, I would say probably 10 years ago, there was a lot of quite a lot of scepticism in our farming communities about uh, climate change and the role that um, uh, farming and anthropogenic forces have on it. But now there is a move for farmers and farmer groups demanding action to um, to adapt and to mitigate greenhouse gas emissions. So the attitudes have, have very much changed as people have seen these impacts in their farm businesses. Um, I'm a pasture scientist at heart, so I'll put up uh, a little bit of an indication of how our pasture systems have changed. Um, this graph here shows a kind of typical pasture growth curve that we would see in, in Southern Australia. Um, the black lines are a historical pattern um, and the green line and the red line, are what we have predicted might happen by 2030 uh, on the green line and by 2070 on, on the red line. So what happens to our pasture growth patterns is we grow more in the winter and early springtime when, when cool temperatures and more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere um, helps pastures grow, but we get this contraction of the growing season, particularly in the springtime. Um, we're not growing pasture for as long uh, through the year. Um, so that's the trend that we predicted to, uh, to occur um, back when we started in this work, maybe just over 10 years ago. But what we're seeing is that this has already occurred. You know, this kind of contraction of the growing season has, has already occurred over the, over the last decade. Um, so with those declining rainfall um, and increasing temperatures, it's probably moving faster than what, um, what we gave it what we would have predicted. Um, and this is kind of where the, the call to action comes from. Um, in in um, conjunction with changes kind of to the average pattern, we are seeing marked increases in variability. So year to year variability um, in climate and that's impacting on our pasture production and, um, and our livestock production as well. Um, so droughts uh, to very good years. Um, you can see on the graph here, this is some uh, pasture yields in springtime from uh, Victoria. And you can look at that period from about uh, 1988 to about 2000 or the early 2000s where our yields were within a very narrow range. Um, and since then you can see the, the variation has, has really dropped out and particularly um, at the lower end of that, um, uh, of that last section of, of the graph where we're seeing some very, very poor growing seasons um, in relation to that uh, declining rainfall. 
So it's become a major challenge uh, for our production systems. So what are some of the things that are happening to address this? Because our farmers are, have evolved and their farm systems have um, you know, developed under this sort of variability. Um, so in the feed base, so this is the pasture base, uh, we're looking at improving soil fertility so that we grow the maximum amount of feed available for each drop of soil moisture that we, that we have available. So making sure our, um, we get the most from each drop of water. Uh, there's a change in, in um, the feed base moving from kind of shallow rooted uh, temperate pasture species like perennial ryegrass um, to more deeper rooted uh, species like fescue or, or summer active grasses. Um, a fair bit of work going on, on on subtropical species which are moving further south um, in, into uh, New South Wales and, and looking at the role of them uh, and how they might support a, a warmer environment. One minute left, uh, Brendan. Please. Sure, okay. Uh, forage cropping um, to fill feed gaps changing uh, livestock management and stocking rates um, as, the, as the season changes um, and diversification in terms of spatial, which I've mentioned an enterprise mix. So I wanted to just talk briefly about greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture make up about uh, 13 or 14% of Australia's greenhouse gas emissions. Most of it's from the energy sector and, and transport. Um, but of the greenhouse gas emissions from Australia, um, about 70% of that is from enteric methane. So our, our beef uh, being the main contributor, but also uh, sheep and, and dairy. Um, as I mentioned at the start, we have this aspirational target for the red meat industries to become carbon neutral. Um, and a lot of research effort and starting to have this implementation on farm to figure out actually how we do this. Um, so uh, a combinations of um, avoiding emissions, um, using feed additives, uh, forages and genetic selection for lower methane. I guess there are feed additives on the market or emerging uh, in the market, but one of the big challenges for Australian systems is how do you deliver those feed additives to cattle that are grazing on pasture. Um, the feedlot sector, certainly that can be done, but on pasture it has much more challenges. Um, so there's emissions avoidance mechanisms, and that's gonna be combined with carbon storage on farms. So thinking about uh, opportunities to increase uh, soil carbon and also greater use of trees on farm, but trees on farm for carbon sequestration, but also to provide that important shade and shelter and biodiversity, which is uh, lacking in many of our farm systems. Okay, so I'll um, finish there and just mention, you know, one of our research project at the moment um, and the website there, if, if anyone's listening is, if anyone's interested, sorry, about the way we go about exploring profitable and sustainable livestock businesses uh, under climate variability. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brennan. And for sure, people will reach out because this topic is very important for Paraguay as well. So uh, now we open the floor to questions. Uh, we are going to wait the questions here in the chat. So if anybody from the public wants to make a question to our experts, now. Now is a chance. Violeta, you let me know if you have questions there, please. Yes, I, I think we will all uh, be able to see the questions because uh, we asked okay. participants to post it in the chat. So in the, in the meantime, I'm going to make like a brief summary of the key points. So while we wait for the questions. So Norma was talking about uh, that uh, research in Paraguay is mainly derived from the private sector. So the public sector is not so in, involved uh, in the research in, uh, in livestock production. And also that Paraguay has a very big plus in the international market because our cattle is grass fed and grass finished. So that's a very good, uh, big comparative advantage. And 
Andrea was talking about a very interesting topic that we have a law that says that 25% of our land should be kept as a forest. And she was uh, talking that if we can organize and connect these corridors, we can increase wildlife. And also uh, man-made water harvest and corridors has a positive impact on wildlife. Mariana uh, was talking about uh, in Brendan about climate change. And Mariana said that education uh, can be used or is needed to make population aware of the real impact of cattle in the climate change. So we can use that information to, to tell people that uh, livestock is not our enemy and it's not the one causing the big damage in, in Paraguayan uh, context. So it's, I think in 10 or 12 years, Mariana, we can recycle that carbon emission. So, and Brandon was talking that in, in, in Australia, uh, we're getting drier um, every year, uh, as even earlier than expected, right? So a call to action is needed to, to mitigate that effect in, in carbon emissions. So we have a question here from the public, so from the participants. If emissions in Paraguay in regards to cattle growth are relatively low, why do you think the Paraguayan press is sometimes saying otherwise? So I will leave this open to whoever wants to answer because it's not addressed to anyone in particular. So I don't know, Mariana, if you want to go because it's about emissions. Norman, you, you raise your hand. I think you can you can go first. And if there is anything no. left to... to... I, yep. I just want to say that the, the entire sustainability issue uh, with livestock is uh, discussed within the context of planetary limits, which is uh, an idea that has gained a lot of traction. And um, because cattle emit a lot of uh, greenhouse gases in many parts of the world where cattle production is tremendously inefficient, like India, Ethiopia, um, uh, parts of the African Sahel and other regions. Um, it, 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 it's being victimized. Um, there's also attack coming from the plant-based foods and genetic or cell-based meat um, and the press has bought into that. And uh, there's also an issue with uh, what we might call envy. Um, a lot of the larger ranch holders are, are very wealthy people with very large land holdings. And the press can't tell the difference between land suitable for agriculture and marginal land that's used for livestock. So um, that's what I want to say. If you'd like to add something, Mariana. Yeah. So one thing that I would like to point out, and, and it's actually that we're all hopeful this new uh, assessment report and actually the IPCC will, is going to fix in the short time is, uh, so when we're talking about carbon emissions, you probably have seen that I'm, I, I talk about CO2 equivalents. So what the IPCC tried to do, and actually they, they recognized that it was the least of the, of the, of the worst things uh, they use as metrics is uh, they, they try to compare CO2 with methane. And so methane uh, has 28 times greater capacity to absorb energy. It, it's, not, it's not exactly like that, but we're gonna, we're gonna say it like this. So um, it has a greater capacity, a, a greater global warming potential, okay? But uh, one thing that is not considered is that methane, as I mentioned before, has a, a low, uh, it, it degrades faster. It takes, it has a, a, an average lifetime of 10 to 12 years, while CO2 lasts 1,000 years. So as it's okay, methane has a greater global warming potential, but it degrades faster. It doesn't accumulate. So you cannot easily compare it to CO2. So I think most of this uh, criticism is coming from that point that methane has uh, 28 times the impact of CO2. That's what people say. 
And actually that's not completely accurate. And right now th there are some publications, especially coming from University of Oxford from Professor Miles Allen and Michelle Kane, that are trying to create these better metrics that really considers these differences between short-lived climate pollutants and long-lived climate pollutants. So specifically to compare CO2 and methane. So that's another misconception that unfortunately it was the best way to do it, but right now they're trying to, to clarify that and to try to rectify that. So probably we're going to be seeing better metrics uh, that take into consideration these intrinsic differences between greenhouse gases and probably we're going to see uh, better responses. So one, sorry, one last point is that at some point, um, there was a hypothesis that said that if we decrease methane emissions, we could use that space left, but this decreasing methane emissions to, to increase our, our CO2 emissions without having any, any problem. And that's actually not true. I didn't have the chance to fully explain that graph that I presented, but that's not the, the case. Okay, again, because they are different, so we cannot exchange one for the other without having any any kind of consequence. Thank you very much, Mariana and Norman. Now we have uh, two more questions here. Uh, considering that whether Australia or Paraguay are more likely to suffer the effects of carbon, uh, what should be the path that these two countries should follow regarding or the coming UN summit? Sorry, it's the effects of climate change. What should be the, the effects of climate change? Yeah. yeah. What should be the path that these two countries should follow regarding the coming UN summit? I think we should make a, a big effort, perhaps a joint effort, to let the world know that our, our cattle is grass fed that uh, there's a lot of efficiency and benefits to, to cattle that are, are, are grass fed, that cattle are part of the solution, not part of the problem to uh, greenhouse gases. Now there's a little bit of a difference between Australia and Paraguay. Paraguay has a, I mean, I'm sorry, Australia has a very large coal industry, which we don't have in Paraguay. So they have emitted some fossil sources, but in the Paraguayan cases, uh, we receive the impacts the extreme events of climate change without being uh, not a major, not even a minor um, contributor to climate change effects. So I think the industrial world has to start investing, making uh, finance available to us if they want us to concentrate on mitigation because what we really need to do in Paraguay is strengthen our abilities uh, in adaptation and systems resilience. Yeah, I might add a little bit to that. Um, I think in the Australian context, uh, Norman's right, you know, we have a big fossil fuel industry and most of it, the emissions are associated with that. But I think we also see that uh, energy sector transforming quite rapidly uh, to renewable uh, sectors. And I think um, that's going to eventually put more emphasis on agriculture and the emissions from agriculture and more pressure on agriculture to reduce uh, their emissions because, um, because as a proportion of the total, agriculture is going to become bigger as, as the other sectors adapt. Um, I do think there's potential, a lot of potential um, to think about adaptation and mitigation um, in our agricultural systems. Um, building in the incentives uh, to do that, I think is, is really important. Uh, at the moment, if we think about carbon price versus livestock production, um, it's really not nowhere near equivalent uh, to use land for uh, mitigation purposes as compared to livestock production. Um, the economic returns for livestock production are much higher than say for growing trees for carbon sequestration. Um, so uh, the incentives, I think, need to be there. Um, in the Australian context, I think we have to also um, have better appreciation for the, the co-benefits that we get from in improving soil carbon, which improves our water holding capacity of the soils and improves our soil health and, and trees in the landscape, which promotes biodiversity and, and shade and shelter. Thank you, Brennan. And I think to close the, the session here, we're going to 
read the question from Carlos. He says, is there a market research about actual global demand, tons per year, and prices paid, dollars per kilogram, for beef cuts with this credential attribute, sustainable by end consumers? So he's talking about- What, what I can say, yeah. can I uh, say something about that? Yes, please. Um, I'm not aware of any global studies but I, I can say this, um, in the United States that uh, I'm more familiar with Southeast United States and, and the Florida case in particular, there is a, a label at, at the largest supermarket chain, which is called Publix, which is grass-fed beef. It's about 20 to 30% more expensive than regular beef. And uh, there's quite a market for it. It is being sold. Um, in the United States, but it's not a sustainable beef label uh, per se. It's a grass-fed label. As far as Europe, that is continuously saying that they want uh, sustainable beef, the CEO of Lidl, which is one of the largest supermarket chains in, in Germany and other uh, countries in Europe, has uh, openly said, and it's it's available online, that he tried very hard to push sustainable beef in the supermarkets, and it just didn't sell because it was something like 15 or 20% more expensive than uh, regular commercial beef. So the incentives probably won't come from the market at first. We're gonna need to use money from the, uh, Green Climate Fund from Jeff and from other sources um, to some way promote, uh, somehow promote sustainable beef. But we also must keep clear the idea that if we don't produce sustainable beef, because it's a long process to produce sustainable beef, and if we don't, we'll be left out of certain markets because although it's not, uh, there is not a big market for it right now and not a premium market, uh, the uh, consumption systems are moving toward it rapidly. And those who have more power in the chain, in the supply chain, which are the finance sector and the packing plant sector, um, are actively pushing for sustainable beef in spite of the lack of incentives. So it's something we're going to have to do. Thank you, Norman. And one last minute question here for Dr. Brandon is, how can we motivate farmers to produce sustainable beef? What are some current examples in the Australian context? Yeah, I, th one. I think um, probably leading on from the, from the last discussion there, I think we're going to see changes in the market which will demand uh, sustainable beef. So not so much uh, perhaps price incentives, um, but um, uh, companies which need to um, meet works or dairy companies which need to uh, show their environmental credentials, I think will start to demand um, carbon neutral uh, production. Uh, so things like Fonterra or Meatworks, uh, I think, I think we're thinking, you know, down the chain, I think this is where the major chain is is going to come is because it will be demanded uh, by the supply chain. Uh, so, um, you know, they won't, if they won't, if you can't sell your beef or we don't get have market access into, into Europe uh, because of those um, reasons, then the change will come and it, and it will change quite quickly. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of beef producers in Australia which are producing you know highly efficient systems and they are you know controlling their grazing and they are integrating uh, trees and, and native vegetation onto their farm so I think you know there's many examples of of good um, and sustainable beef production um, in Australia um, but I guess historically there's been a lot of clearing and a lot of loss of biodiversity um, as the beef industry has expanded as well, but regulations have changed um, and that clearing is no longer occurring. 
I guess we have seen the a rise as well of the sort of niche products, um, which are, you know, have these um, credentials and, um, uh, you know, beef beef certified to be have been produced in a sustainable way, but as defined by a, a set of criteria that, um, you know, a, a particular company may be prescribing. Thank you, Brandon. So. Andrea, Norma, Mariana, and Brendan, it's been a privilege to have uh, all of you with us. You are leading experts in your areas. And for sure, our, uh, the presentations and more questions will come later. But in the meantime, we'd like to thank you for having this time for us. And also a big, uh, it was a big success, I think. Many questions will uh, have arise a reason here. And also a thank you to the PSA because you organized this, uh, this opportunity to, to listen about production, sustainability, and livestock. So this is the end of the presentations of the panel. So, uh, but this is on the day one from the Paraguay Speaks. Tomorrow we will have more, but Violeta, you will have some more, yeah. Sarah. Yeah, thank you very much to you too, Julio, for, for being the moderator. And thank you to all the panelists for participating in this event. Uh, and thank you as well to the audience for the question. And I would like to remind everybody that you can rewatch this session on YouTube channel. And we're looking forward to see you tomorrow on the webinar on sequencing of the genome of SARS-CoV-2 in Paraguay. So it's been a great session today. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. See ya. Bye-bye.